So, hello, welcome back everyone on Moodle. Um, unfortunately, if you're watching this on Moodle, you're missing the apparently best part of the stream. Um, that's the <laughs> animated GIFs. <laughs> so, uh, let's continue. Um, we still have like 20 slides to do, and I still, I think there's still a little, little demo that, uh, that's there, so. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I just started recording again, so we're recording. All right, so when you want to detect proteins, right, because we, after you've separated proteins, you, you only know what their isoelectric point is if you do it by 2D gel, uh, and you know the size of them, um, but then um, you, you have to still figure out which protein it is. Um, so uh, detecting proteins in a cell or a tissue uh, can be done by exploiting things like antibodies nowadays. Um, so you can, hey, you can, you can have like a purified protein, um, then inject this into rabbits, and then the rabbits will produce antibodies for it. And then after you have your antibodies, you can do two things. Um, and that, that is that you can uh, make a peroxidase towards your antibodies. So that means that uh, the antibody itself is connected to a peroxidase, um, and then had this produces a, a color reaction. Um, and then you can use this um, either in a slice, so this is, this is for example a slice of tissue, um, and then he here you see the little black dots, and these black dots are made by an antibody and a peroxidase. Uh, nowadays what you normally do is you, you make your antibody, and then you add a fluorophore to it, um, for example a red or a green or a yellow one, and then you can do immunofluorescence, and then instead of having like only a single color, like with uh, a peroxidase, you can have like three or four different colors. So you can also see if proteins are com combined together at a certain point in the cell. Um, and you can do this just using light microscopy, or you can just use a um, better microscope to do it inside of a cell even. All right, so uh, another way of uh, knowing what a protein is, is of course X-ray crystallof uh, crystallography. Um, and this is a technique for determining the atomic and molecular structure of a crystal. Um, so um, to do this, you have your crystal, uh, then you mount your crystal on a geonometer, um, you illuminate the crystal, um, by x-rays, so you just shoot x-rays through the crystal and then you capture the def uh, diffraction pattern and then this geonometer changes one degree and then the process repeats and then it changes one degree again and then it repeats. So hey, you take your crystal and you, you slowly rotate the crystal around and at every point uh, you get, uh, you do an uh, x-ray um, beam through through your crystal uh, and then you get uh, a head this produces then a Fourier transform a Fourier transformed um, electron density map because electrons are the things that make um, x-rays bend um, so you get a, a picture and this picture you can then transform back um, into how your protein um, looks like. So where are the electrons? And if you know where are the electrons, then you can then take the protein chain and then fit that through. Um, which is of course all done more or less in bioinformatics. Of course the, 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 the first part not, so uh, crystallizing your protein is the, is the hard part. Um, getting your protein to crystallize, especially when you're dealing with proteins which are in the cell wall, is very hard um, because they are very um, hydrophobic. Um, but if you have proteins which are inside of a cell, then you can, you can crystallize them and there's a whole protocol that you can follow. Um, and then this part is just done um, well, that's kind of standard. Hey, you, you put the crystal on there. Uh, one of the issues, of course, here is, is that since x-rays have a relatively high amount of energy, um, you often melt your protein in the process. So you have to not make one crystal, but you have to make many different crystals. Um, and then have, every time you have to, to mount them. Um, and then Fourier transform, which is a mathematical um, way of going from Fourier space to normal space, um, which I don't really want to explain right now, um, but then you can use Fourier transformation and then you get an, an electron density map. And since you did that for every um, position, right, because you rotated the crystal around, uh, you get a 3D, um, you get a 3D map. So you get a map from the front, from the sides and have from every angle. And then you can fill in uh, where the protein is and where the different side chains are. 
Another way to uh, figure out what kind of a protein you're dealing with is to use nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, yeah, so this is also something that I don't want to explain in detail, but it's the physical phenomena in which the nuclei in a magnetic field absorbs and re-emits re an electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. Um, so hey, what you do is you just put um, your, um, your protein into a solution and then this solution can then be um, in put into a very strong magnetic field and then hey you you hit the solution with uh, radio waves and then hey you look to see when the radio waves get back and then based on doing that um, a lot of times you can kind of figure out what kind of a, a protein you have um, and of course NMR is called MRI when you do it in the hospital um, but uh, when you do it for proteins you need machines which look more or less like this compared to a normal MRI machine where you can go in um, because you need a very very strong magnetic field so the, the, the magnetic field in an NMR machine is generally 800 to 1000 times stronger uh, than the standard MRI machine in the hospital. Another way which is really good at identifying how your protein looks like or what your protein is composed of is using mass spectrometry and uh, next week we will talk a lot about mass spectrometry uh, because next week we're talking about metabolites um, so and that's the that's the thing that proteins work on so we go DNA, RNA, protein and then metabolites um, and I will explain in great detail what um, a mass spectrometry is and I will also introduce you to databases which allow you to identify your uh, mass spectrometry spectra that you get um, but hey, just in a few words it's a technique that ionizes chemical species or chemical um, well little molecules more or less and then sorts the ion based on their mass over charge ratio um, so what you have is you have something called your um, your ion source where you make your ions this is generally using uh, electrospray ionization um, and then this is pooled so hey you have your ions which is a little droplet that is pooled towards a big magnet where you then have a time of flight machine um, which then hey using the magnet you 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 bend the waves um, so this is not a time of flight machine but this is a machine which uh, and then you these wave bend so um, if the mass over charge ratio is very high right that means that you have more mass per positive or negative energy um, then you the, the, the turn that it makes is um, less gradual because hey, of course heavier objects um, take more power from the magnet to get bent uh, while smaller objects don't and then you have uh, something called Faraday collectors um, which then collect the um, the uh, ions right so if an ion hits the plate it will give you a little signal and then in the end you will get a nice spectrogram and then this spectrogram you can then use to figure out which molecules are making up your protein all right so very quick overview I told you about four of these different identification techniques so you can use immunohistochemically um, which is done a lot nowadays because hem making antibodies is something that we're relatively good at um, and you can use x-ray crystallography which is really good when you're dealing with um, proteins which are which you can easily make crystals of which is very hard for things that are in the cell wall but relatively easy for things which are in the cytosol um, that's also one of the reasons why you're looking when you look into protein databases protein databases generally have more structures for uh, things which are not in the cell wall so proteins which are globular um, hey, like uh, one of the first ones getting solved uh, was insulin hey, insulin is is not in the cell wall um, so hey, that's a relatively easy thing to crystallize um, the same goes for hemoglobin um, but hey, things like the insulin receptor hey, these are very difficult to crystallize so that's why um, the structure of insulin receptor took way longer uh, than for insulin itself you can use NMR. NMR has, has the advantage that it's more or less a dynamic method, so you can see proteins move in a way, so you can track like how the how the, the protein moves, and you can use mass spectrometry. Uh, mass spectrometry is a really good way to figure out what are the individual constituents uh, of your protein, but it's really bad at at puzzling the protein together, right? But if you and it it 
it's it's just different from crystallography which gives you a 3d map mass spectrometry just gives you a 2d overview of what is in your protein um, but these four techniques are used a lot when you do protein analysis um, so. all right so then uh, when we talk about proteins then proteins are always classified by their function so um, these are the official definitions for proteins so proteins fall into one of these seven categories so a protein can be a structural protein for example a collagen or keratin um, and at the example or the, the function of these proteins is to strengthen tendons to make skin hair and nails um, then there's something uh, or there's a class of protein which is uh, the enzyme proteins uh, these are things with which catalyze um, um, uh, a certain chemical reaction. Um, an example here is DNA polymerase. This, this catalyzes the reaction of DNA to DNA. So it's the duplication of DNA. Um, but of course there are many many different enzymes. Hey, you also have an enzyme which breaks down insulin. You have an enzyme which um, produces ATP. Um, so hey, enzyme is a very broad category where most of the enzyme or most of the proteins have some kind of enzymatic activity. We have transport proteins. Transport proteins just bind something, bring it somewhere else, and then release it, like hemoglobin, uh, which transports oxygen to the cell. Um, we have contractile proteins, which are mostly found in muscles, um, for example, actin and myosin, um, and these cause contraction of the muscles. So these are generally like uh, very small molecular motors, um, which, which cause things to be able to move. We have protective proteins. Um, antibodies fall under protective proteins but not just the antibodies also uh, the complement complex falls under protective proteins so complement uh, the complement uh, things are things of the innate immune system while antibodies are based on the adaptive immune system uh, then we have things like hormones so hormones are things like insulin or leptin or these kinds of protein um, and their function is to to regulate uh, metabolism um, not in a short-term manner but more in a long-term manner so hey, if we're talking about a, 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 a half an hour to an hour hey, then this for a cell is a long-term process and these things are regulated by hormones um, and and we also have something which is called toxins and toxins are more or less the opposite of the protective proteins and these are things like snake venom um, so these are um, toxic to humans. Um, toxins are of course a little bit of a difficult category because toxins might not be toxic, uh, which sometimes happens. Because it's just, yeah, it's what's good for someone is bad for someone else. Um, so hey, something which is an antibody, hey, you can see an antibody as a toxin for bacteria, right? So there's a little bit of an overlap between those two. Um, so. All right, so the function of the protein, of course, comes from the different domains of the protein. Uh, so a protein domain is defined as a conserved part of a given protein sequence and its tertiary structure that can evolve and function and exist independently of the rest of the protein chains. Uh, so hey, if you take like 100 proteins and you would do multiple sequence alignment on them, then you find that um, hey, if these 100 proteins have a, a part which is similar, then this gets annotated as being a domain of that protein so domains are things which do one thing and do it very well right like um, DNA binding a protein can have a DNA binding domain and then have a signal domain and that then it binds DNA and then it signals another protein um, but it could also have a DNA binding domain and then a replication domain to, for example, copy the DNA. But of course it needs this binding domain and a lot of proteins or have a DNA binding domain. And these DNA binding domains are very similar. And they're generally always alpha helices uh, which fit into the major groove. Uh, then you have a complementary protein, so an alpha and a beta part of the protein, one which binds the major groove, one which binds the minor, minor groove. Um, so had these things um, are called protein domains. And knowing which domains are in a protein can help us understand the function of a protein. Hey, if you, for example, figure out that the protein you are studying has a heme group, uh, then you know that this protein is somehow involved in oxygen, right? Because heme uh, binds oxygen um, because of the iron molecule and the structure. So if you know that your protein has a heme 
mole or has a heme domain, uh, then uh, this will almost always lead to you hypothesizing that your protein has something to do with the oxygen metabolism in the body. All right, so besides protein domains, we also define something which are called protein families. And a protein family is a group of evolutionary related proteins and is often nearly synonymous with a gene family. And because proteins are coded by genes, then if you find that something is a gene family, then the genes of this gene family code for proteins of the same protein family, which does not always have to, have to, to be true um, because protein families can split as well. So things can still be related on DNA level, while on protein level they have very separate separate function. Um, yeah, but as long as things are evolutionary related, um, then these proteins are more or less part of the same protein family. So in, in, in total at the moment there are like 60,000 protein families uh, which have been defined. Um, and yeah, you can think about things like um, um, like uh, myostatin and you have like as so far like the the um, uh, the the heme carrying proteins uh, there are a whole bunch of them some they function in muscles some function in blood some others function when you are very young or in in the embryonic stage um, yeah, but there's different proteins that bind oxygen which are more or less ac active at different parts of your life um, so how do these new protein families come about? Well, that can become uh, that come that comes through either speciation. So when a new sp or when when a species exists and it splits into two different species, or it can arise due to gene duplication. If a gene in the genome gets duplicated, and then you now all of a sudden have two genes which code for the same protein. Um, but of course, um, due to mutation and recombination, this new duplicated gene in the course of evolution will get a new function and so these proteins are still evolutionary related um, but they are having different functions and often knowing which protein family your protein belongs to is very important um, to know which kind of major um, major part your your uh, your protein will play in um, so have th things of the same family have more or less the same function. Yeah, so if you're in a family of DNA binding proteins, then of course all of these proteins in this family will bind DNA. Alright, so there's a lot of tools to look at, at proteins, so to look at protein families and also to look at protein domains. Um, so there's something called PFAM, which is the protein family database, and uh, it has a whole bunch of alignments and hidden Markov models to kind of predict uh, if an unknown protein belongs to one of the known families. Um, you have ProSite, which is the main database of protein domains, families and functional sites. Um, you have PIRFS, which is the super family classification system because families are not the end all to everything. Yeah, because having 60,000 families means that all of these families also have relationships amongst them. So yeah, that's why you have things called super families. Um, and then hey, you have the PAS2, which is an algorithm to do protein alignment of structural family of structural super families. Um, hey, you have super family, which is a library of hidden marker model to kind of determine if a protein or if a protein that you're looking at belongs to a certain family or to a certain superfamily. And then hey, there's also the different classification algorithms. So hey, all of these you can you can look up. I just want you guys to be aware hey, that uh, PFAM exists. Um, so PFAM is the database for protein families and ProSite is the database of protein domains. Of course they also have the families, but their main focus is the different domains. So hey, if I have a protein, um, what does amino acid 12 to 50 code for and what does amino acid 70 to 80 code for while PFAM just classifies your protein into a family of proteins so it says well it's a globin or it's a, it's a, 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 a contractile protein right so those are those are more or less families all right, so when we talk about proteins, we also have to talk a little bit of phylogenetic trees. Um, so this is a really nice uh, picture of Mr. Mrs. Garrison uh, explaining a level three phylogenetic network. Uh, of course, this is not really how the tree of life looks like. The tree of life looks more or less like this. Um, so this is a phylogenetic tree based on 
rRNA data uh, with the emphasis of the separation of bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes, um, and this was proposed in the early 1990s. Um, so before that, um, the tree of life actually consisted only of two groups, of eukaryota and of bacteria, um, but nowadays we also have a group called archaea, uh, so the archaea are more or less the extremophiles, so these are the little creatures that are not bacteria, they are not multicellular organisms really, um, but they kind of, they, they have like things like methanococcus, um, so this is kind of, it looks like a bacteria, but it has very, some features from the eukaryota, um, and hey, if you then look at the tree of life, then every life started at some point, we don't know exactly what the, the common ancestor is, um, but at a certain point this split into bacteria and into into archaea and then the archaea branch more or less split again into the eukaryota. Um, so these bacteria or archaea, they well they're not really bacteria, they are between bacteria and eukaryotes. Um, yeah, so one of the nice things is, is that you can, it, that these, um, these animals um, to, yeah, because they're all animalia, um, then this part of the, the uh, animal tree um, they have properties which uh, occur in bacteria, but some of them also have properties which occur only in, in eukaryota. Um, yeah, so it's very difficult to decide, decide where exactly in the tree you fall, um, but this is based on our RNA data, so hey, as we learned from the, um, from the RNA lecture, this is based on ribosomal RNA because of course ribosomal RNA changes very, very slowly because the ribosomes are under immense selective pressure. Hey, you can't just have my mutations in your ribosomes because hey, if you change a single amino acid, the entire ribosome might not work anymore. So using ribosomal RNA, you can look back more or less until the beginning of like life as, as we know it, like okay, bacteria and, and eukaryotes, um, if you would do these trees based on different or on other types of, of RNA or different types of DNA, um, then of course this tree would look a little bit different. Um, but uh, based on our RNA you can look back like billions of years almost in time, hey, if you would look at mitochondrial DNA, hey, then that will allow you to look back in the time span of like 100,000 to 200,000 years, and if you would look at individual like proteins or other types of, of, of DNA or RNA, hey, then that generally gives you an overview in the, in the range of like 10,000 years. Um, but hey, our RNA, because ribosomes are so important for duplication of cells and making proteins, they change very, very slowly in the course of evolution. Um, yeah, so you can see here that plants are all the way here, yeah, and then you have animals that come here, right? So animal plants are split, and then you have fungi which splits between animal and plants, but there's like a whole bunch of animals that came before there, yeah, like the flagellatus or the entromoeba, uh, and, and yeah, that, that's still a, like a, a a billion years away from when the bacteria and the archaea split from each other. So phylogenetic trees are very important to understand how life um, is related to each other um, and it's a really good way of visualizing how things, uh, things are related to each other on large timescales or on small timescales. Alright, so how to read a phylogenetic tree? Well, it's a branching diagram which shows the inferred evolutionary relationships among proteins or among RNA or among DNA, um, but you always have to remember that this is inferred. So this is based on, for example, sequence distances. Um, but there can be, um, yeah, so it's based on similarities and differences in sequence and structure. Um, yeah, so, taxas, so taxas are these branches, right? So this is, for example, a taxa, the taxa of animal, plants and fugota. Uh, what if all humans are like doll? They think they have freedom and choice, but in reality we are programmed clowns. We are programmed to do what we are doing. Well, in a way we are. It's a, it's a very, very philosophical way of looking at it. Um, I, I would say that pff, that's a difficult one. Do I believe, believe, think that free choice exists? I think that that's way, way too far when we're talking about just proteins and biology. Um, but in a way, like as a bioinformatician, you do view life as being a machine. 
So hey, you, there's inputs, there's signal transduction, and there's output. Um, so it's a very, very interesting way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, in that sense, I believe more in the in in holism, right? Because you have as a cell, you are just input, signal transduction, and output. But if you put several cells together. Uh, then things become more interesting and you can have like behaviors which are not obvious based on the DNA uh, or based on, on, on the structure of how things are built. So uh, collections of things can be much more interesting than the individual parts. But as a bioinformatician you generally look at how like little parts of this big machine work. Um, and of course like has something like um, awareness is um, is a product of all of these underlying mechanisms building up to something um, but um, it's very philosophical so and then I'm, I'm not a philosopher I'm a bioinformatician so I just study biology um, chemistry and use computers informatics to kind of tie these things together but thank you for your remark Puya M9 I haven't seen you before in the stream, so um, welcome. So, um, hey, so taxas uh, joined together. Um, we imply that there's a common ancestor, right? So here we see that this tree, like animals, fungi, and plant, all have like a single common origin. So we assume that at a certain point in time there was some animal living, which then split into three different kind of branches uh, of life. And of course, we, we have no idea what this branch was, but the closer you get here, the more we know how things are, are related uh, to each other. Um, but the, the, the key word here is, is that it is inferred, and this inference is based on similarities and differences. Um, and that is um, tricky, because sequences or, or similarities and differences can occur quite rapidly um, and I want to talk about that a little bit. So uh, the first term that I want to introduce is the term orthologue and now things start becoming complex and I, I don't really agree with how this is defined but the thing is is that I just have to learn you how it is defined. So an orthologue is uh, defined as a homologous sequence. So homologous sequence means that there's a sequence which is having similarity to another sequence if they are inferred to be descended from the same ancestral sequence separated by a speciation event. Right, so if you look at for example hemoglobin in humans and hemoglobin in mice both have hemoglobin and these two hemoglobins are orthologous to each other right because both humans and mice are joined in this taxa tree by a common ancestor um, so then we call hemoglobin in mice orthologous to hemoglobin in humans so orthology is strictly defined in terms of ancestry um, and orthologs often but not always have the same function like hemoglobin in mice does the same thing as hemoglobin in human, um, but it doesn't have to. So that's one of these things that kind of um, is, is difficult. When we talk about a paralog, then this is a homologous sequence which is created by a duplication event in the genome. So we know that in the genome we have things like um, jumping genes, and so we have uh, genes which can roll out of the DNA and then copy themselves and jump into another part of the gene. Um, but also sometimes when a DNA strand is replicated, um, the machinery fails and it copies the same part twice. So instead of having one part of the, of the DNA copied, it actually makes two copies in a row. So this is a duplication event. So we take a, a, a sequence of DNA and then this sequence of DNA all of a sudden is in the genome twice. Um, so then we define two different types of paralogs. One of them is in paralogs, which are paralog pairs that arose after a speciation event. So we have a speciation event, so for example the branching of human and mice, and then in mouse there is a duplication event then gene A and gene B are in paralogs of each other in mice. We also have out paralogs, so we can have the common ancestor of mice and humans in which a, uh, in which a gene got duplicated, and then mice and humans split. 
right? So then it means that mice have two copies of the gene and humans also have two copies of the gene. But then we call it an out paralog um, and that had, that is just because we want to kind of have, we want to have an idea when, when the duplication event occurred. So an in paralog is a duplication event which is relatively recent, right? Because it only occurred in human but not yet in mice. Well an out paralog is a is a duplication event which is much older because it already occurred before humans and mice split from each other. So defining these is very important when you're building these phylogenetic trees. All right, so in a picture, and I, I actually have two pictures because I always find it confusing myself. So all of these things we call homologs, right? So for example, here we have an early globin gene and the early globin gene got a gene duplication event, making the alpha chain and the beta chain, right? So we used to have one protein chain, um, has so one gene coding for one protein chain, then there was a duplication event, and afterwards mutations made the second chain different from the first one. So we call the first one the alpha chain, and then the second one we call the beta chain. So now we start having, and so all of these things are homologs. So the, a, the alpha chain is a homolog to the beta chain. And now we have things which are more or less, um, and so now speciation events occur. So now there's a speciation event, so frogs get their own alpha chain, chickens get their own alpha chain, and mice get their own alpha chain, right? So there's, there's this is in the common ancestor, and then due to evolution, now new, um, new species occur. So all of these are called orthologs, right? So the alpha chain is an orthologue, the alpha chain in mouse is an orthologue of the alpha chain in chickens, is an alpha, is an orthologue of the alpha chain in frogs. The same thing holds for the, for the beta, right? Because had this, this speciation event, which, which was observed in the alpha chain, was also observed in the beta chain. So and we call mouse beta, chicken beta, and frog beta, we call all of that orthologs from each other. And now we call the mouse alpha a paralog of mouse beta. The same thing holds for the chick alpha, so chick alpha is a paralog of chick beta, by definition. All right? So now the question is, is this, to you guys, is this an in paralog or is this an out paralog? mouse alpha to mouse beta. Is this an in paralog or an out paralog um, event? Uh, is the, are these in paralogs or out paralogs? I will wait a moment. There's a little bit of um, delay in the stream and you need some, uh, some thinking as well. All right, Skrita says out paralog. So I want to see some more answers. Just, well, normally I would say raise your hand if you if you agree, um, but we can't do that here. So so you really have to like get on the keyboard and type. All right, so I self is also out paralog. How come you have 19 in front of your name? That's interesting. How, how do you get a, a common, I thought that there were only like people with swords and diamonds and without things. <laughs> out paralog. Huh, interesting. I'm learning new Twitch things every time that I stream. Like, could you explain to me why you have the 19 in front of your name? Is that something that I did? Or, like, Jan has a, has a nice diamond, because I know that I, uh... Oh, TwitchCon 2019. Oh, interesting. Super interesting. All right. It's going for TwitchCon 2019. Perfect. <sighs> Twitch is, it, it has so many like strange things. All right, so we, we solved that question. And yes, it is an out paralog. You are all right. It is an out paralog because um, you can hoover over the badges, um, but I can't do that in OBS actually, um, because I'm, uh, oh, I actually can. TwitchCon NA 2019. Interesting, super VIP, ha, huh. okay. Uh, but yeah, you are right, this is an out paralog. Why is this an out paralog? Because it ro arose, so the, the paralog, so the duplication event was before the speciation event. 
All right, very good. So here we have again uh, the same. Um, and now here I'm. Uh, this this picture shows uh, the uh, the out paralogs and the in paralogs uh, because there's no in paralogs in this picture. So here we have ancestral gene A, which then got duplicated in A accent and A accent accent. So A pff, hoovery thingy and then A hoover hoover. Um, and then there was a lineage divergence. So here it diverged, right? So the A1 then diverged into species one and species two. Um, and then you have the other one. It, it's just, it always boggles my mind, but at least you got it right. So um, there, there, there's bound to be at least one question on the exam. I find it a little bit arbitrary. I know why people want to define stuff as in paralogs and out paralogs because there's kind of a, a, a time difference between them. Um, but uh, I find it a little bit arbitrary, right? Because um, we will get to that in the next slides. Um, and that, and like there's things which kind of break this whole nice tree structure, this whole nice uh, in and out paralog thing. Um, so that's what I want to talk about. So, and that's the xenologs. So another log, um, and xenologs are homology um, between two genes resulting from either horizontal gene transfer between two organisms are called xenologs. Um, so this is a very common mechanism in, in antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Um, so you can imagine that, for example, we have, for example, E. coli, uh, which on the DNA has an antibiotic resistant gene. And then um, the bacteria at a certain point thinks like, oh, um, there's streptococcus pneumoniae living next to me. So let's make a little tube and give them this antibiotic resistance gene. And that just happens. Like genes from one bacteria, um, if you co-culture them, they just all of a sudden appear in the other bacteria. Um, and there's a couple of reasons how that happens. Um, so hey, there's actually four. So how can this happen? How can this gene go from being in one bacterial species to being in a completely different bacterial species? Well, one of them is transformation. Uh, transformation is just a process in which uh, a, a single black bacteria dies. So hey, imagine that the E. coli has the antibiotic resistance, the, ant uh, the E. coli bacteria dies, and all of the stuff within the E. coli bacteria just dumps into the environment. And then uh, the streptococcus pneumoniae comes by and it just eats up this little piece of DNA and thinks, oh, nice, little piece of DNA. Let that integrate that into my genome. And it does. And of course, now it gained the ability to make this antibiotic resistance. So one bacteria dying leaves the little piece of DNA in the environment. So this is, of course, more or less a random process, right? Bacteria die, other bacteria comes around, just, ooh, nice DNA, slurps the DNA in. And actually, every bacteria has a whole system to slurp up DNA from the environment. Then there's even inside of the bacteria, there's kind of a complex which then tests if this DNA is producing a protein, which might be or might not be useful. But if it codes for a protein, then it, then it actually gets priority of being integrated into the genome. So bacteria are, are pretty smart because they know that just slurping up random DNA from the environment is an evolutionary advantage. Um, one of the other things is, is that it can become, uh, it, it, can come, it, it can jump from one to the other by conjugation. And conjugation is something which is not well understood why it happens, but it's a very good mechanism. Um, but all of us, and so this this uh, this E. coli bacteria, it has some nice uh, antibiotic resistance gene um, on a plasmid, and uh, some Streptococcus comes by, and they kind of like each other, so they form this little protein tube, uh, so they conjugate, and they they start exchanging genetic material. Why you would do that? Why you would think that that would be a good idea to just like exchange DNA with some random bacteria that you just met? Um, but it happens. Bacteria are, in that sense, very liberal. Like they, they conjugate with other bacteria if they feel like it, and they, they just transfer some of the genetic material. Like I have a couple of these plasmids, and you can have like one or two, and I want one or two back. So hey, there's conjugation, and they just move uh, back genetic material from the one to the other. And of course, then there's transduction. So transduction happens uh, when uh, a bacterial phage uh, introduces a new gene into the bacteria. 
right? So a bacterial phage is more or less like a virus, which is specifically aimed at bacteria. Um, so if you have a bacterial phage, uh, it can it can inject its DNA into the bacteria. And sometimes the bacteria that it infects is actually not the bacteria where it is. Because normally when it injects its DNA, the bacteria starts producing new phages. And then the, the bacteria bursts open um, and spreads the phages all around. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the, 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 the phage um, genome does not get... Uh, is not able to kind of replicate within inside the bacteria or not form new phages. So that means that the bacteria just gets the DNA from the bacterial phage, integrates it to, into its genome, and then says, well, that's nice, more, more properties for me, right? Because that's the thing that it does. So hey, it just stores the DNA and things like, well, it, I might need like this capsule molecule later. Um, and that's, that's called transduction. So a bacterial phage produced in a one uh, will kind of give bacteri bact uh, bacterial DNA from one bacteria to the other um, because it comes with and this doesn't really kill the bacteria because this phage is for a different species. Um, so transduction occurs also, um, uh, well not a lot but it occurs um, and this is usually phage driven so and of course one of the things that we do all the day in the lab is, is horizontal gene transfer using genetic engineering. We nowadays um, can make competent bacterial cells and put any part of the DNA in there, right? We can just take the green fluorescent protein, which comes from jellyfish, and then we just clone it uh, or clone it. We just we just put it in uh, bacteria, or we put it in human cells, or or in mice cells, or other cells that we have around the lab. And of course, this is also a horizontal gene transfer mechanism, but it's not a natural mechanism. It's it's an artificial. Um, and of course, this makes this um, this tree very complex, especially when we're looking at the bacterial branch, right? Because in the bacterial branch, it looks like everything is really nice. Um, but of course, like part of uh, bacteria can, can just jump from, so a gene can just jump from one part of the tree to the other part of the tree. Not only that, but the same thing happens in some eukaryota. Of course, hey, the, the, the more complex of a, of a eukaryota you are, uh, the more difficult it is um, to kind of integrate new genome or new DNA into your genome. But it happens. Um, there, there are instances of um, bacterial DNA being integrated into the human genome, which then would, if you would look at this specific piece of DNA, you would say, well, but humans are very close to Spirocetus. Yeah, because we, we might have part of a gene uh, which is coming from Spirocetus integrated into the human genome, um, which is then not found in, in mice or in, or in, in plants even. Yeah, so this tree looks very nice, um, but this only looks very nice because it's based on this ribosomal RNA. And of course, uh, ribosomes are very well maintained because without ribosomes or with non-functional ribosomes, uh, you can kind of reduced from the from the selection pool directly. But if you look at other genes, um, then sometimes you see that the tree that is being built based on homology and similarity, or based on the in of the, on the idea of in paralogs and out paralogs, um, it it just doesn't it just doesn't function. So you get like weird relationships, um, which show that humans and dolphins are actually really closely related. And that is because of these uh, horizontal gene transfer, because of this, this Xenolog um, mechanisms. All right, so I, I, uh, I wanted to uh, show you one of the bioinformatic resources. We've been talking about Interpro um, for the functional analysis, of, uh, functional analysis of proteins by classifying them into families and predicting domains. And this is one of the most important sites uh, when it comes to, to proteins. So if you have your own protein of interest, um, so uh, we can do that. So I'm going to switch to Firefox again and I think I already opened up Interpro. Yes, I did and I already did a run with the insulin receptor for humans. Um, but um, if you have your favorite protein, just tell me now. And we're not going to do the Tau one again because the Tau one was just bad. Well, it wasn't bad, but it's just like it doesn't really have a structure. and We already know what kind of domain it has because it has this tau domain. Um, so in this case, it would be nice to have like a relatively big protein. Um, and um, I did the human human insulin receptor just so that you guys, uh, um, um, that we don't have to wait if it takes a long time. Um, but just let's open up a new window and um, 
Favorite protein, anyone? First come, first serve. And otherwise, I'm just going to take uh, one of my my own. Then we're going to just look at insulin, which is. I did the human lactase, but it doesn't work. You did the human lactase in Interpro or in the uh, or in the prediction or in the uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Uh, let me see. Open up the preview. Well, actine. Oh, the prediction of the structure. Yeah, but lactase is again. It doesn't. It, it the, the prediction works really well if it has a couple of nice alpha sheets and beta sheets. Um, uh, ac prediction. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking we can we can do things like well, not the tau protein. Um, but if we think about proteins, right, then um, one of the things that I always am interested in is the current pandemic going on. So we can use like the spike protein um, and, and of course the spike protein of, uh, of, of, of uh, well, no, let's, let's do some other one. Let's do, uh, um, because viruses are generally not having like really nice structure, but um, and ribosomes take too long to predict. Hemoglobin. Yeah, we can do hemoglobin. So let's do hemoglobin. Um, so we can go to uh, we can go to here. And then we just search for hemoglobin, and of course hemoglobin occurs in a, ah. All right. So again, um, pseudo Terranova decipiens. Does anyone know? Like, do we do we want to know which kind of an animal this is? I'm always like like guessing animals from their Latin name is really really difficult. Um, but yeah, just like hemoglobin from this uh, pseudo Terranova decipiens. Um, I could actually Google it in another window and look very smart, um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to Google it for you guys here. Um, so is uh, fish health? Is there not a nice Wikipedia or picture? That, no, that don't go to images. Uh, this is a parasitic nematode. It's a fish parasite, of course, Jan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fish guys here have a massive advantage for the weird names. Uh. Causes anisake. What the hell? Like, oh my god! Like, you, you actually know, like, wow. I think it's a mouse. No, it's a mouse. A mouse is a mus, mus musculus, or mus musculus domesticus, or um, so. Interesting. Interesting. All right, so we're not interested in that, but um, so we're just going to take uh, the, the sequence here. So again, we're just going to click on FASTA um, and then we're going to take this hemoglobin from this um, fish nematode. All right, just take the... Yeah, no, I don't want to tell you about my visit. <laughs> I'm already logged in. You know who I am. Like, you, you know everything of me. All right, so we can just enter the FASTA sequence in this format, right? And then we can just search. Um, of course, this should be relatively quick. Um, because it's a known sequence. <coughs> we studied that last semester. Well, see that this course is really, really useful. Did you know that this, this thing actually had a... a um, shame on me. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really fun... That, that's just the first thing that comes up when you search for hemoglobin. Um, I think hemoglobin is just... It just has a globu globular structure. So we have to wait a little bit, right? Um, so we can we can look at the results from this one. Um, all right. So here do you then see the uh, so and this is the one from uh, insulin. Um, so here you see that uh, the family is that it's uh, <coughs> this is the insulin receptor that I did. Um, so it's the insulin-like receptor, and here it's the insulin receptor. And you see that this is part of uh, so it, it consists of one big domain here. Then it has a secondary domain, and then it has a third domain here. Um, so hey, it does. It it. This is probably the domain which goes into the membrane. Um, this is the domain which recognizes insulin on either the outside or does the signal transduction on the inside. And then here you have another domain uh, which does the signal transduction or the recognition, right? And then here you see the superfamilies, and then it it shows you which sites are conserved. Um, so this is a. T 
tier kinase receptor um, um, and hey, there's unintegrated stuff and there's predictions um, hey, but all of these things you can you can click on and you can learn more hey, but the, the thing that you'd learn directly from the insulin receptor is that it's composed of three very distinct parts and hey, these parts of course are evolutionarily uh, uh, um, uh, fixed in a way. So there's many proteins which have this uh, receptor L domain. And so if you would click on this receptor L domain, like, uh, don't move around. Can I not go there? Yeah, so it, it will highlight the, the receptor L domain and then it should be giving me more information about that as well. Why, why don't we go back? All right, so. I have to Google that? That's so horrible. Why, why don't it allow... It used to allow me to click on it. Like the, the website looks a lot fancier than it did like two years ago when it was still like uh, looking a little bit like 1990s. Um, <laughs> but actually here it would then... Like I don't know why it's not allowing me to click on the... Or should I click on these? No. Oh. All right, but I can just look for the PFOM thing. So PF013, right? And it says the L domain and it actually goes to its own website. Um, yeah, so the L domain from these receptors make up a bi low ball ligand binding site. Each L domain consists of a single stranded right beta handed helix. The PFOM entry is missing the first 50 amino acids residues of the domain um, for some reason. But and so you can see that there's three different structures and this, this structure here, if we would uh, search for it, the IPR, um, yeah, because the, it's, the, it's the insulin receptor, yeah, this would probably be a domain um, which is allowing it to enter into or go into cell wall, but this is actually um, a dimeric glycop composed of disulfide, molecular weight is involved in cell adhesion, cell morphology, thrombosis, cell migration. So yeah, it's something that is in the cell wall um, and probably a couple of them they, they make a, a pore so that insulin can be going out or inside of the cell. Um, but let's stop that. This one should be done. Okay, so this is uh, the hemoglobins from the pseudo Terra Nova decifiance which actually everyone knows what it is, but I didn't. So you see that this one is composed of uh, one big domain. So it's a globular, right? So it's it's a globular protein, meaning that it's, it's, a, it's a blob. And then there's two parts of it. So there's a globin and then there's another globin. And then this globin has another globin. So this is actually a very uninteresting protein because the only thing that people really know about it is that it's, it's, it's shaped like a ball. And it's not shaped like a single ball, but it's probably shaped like two little balls with a with a little chain towards it. Um, of course, hey, you can then use the same amino acid sequence, um, which I probably still copied. Come on, um, and then we can go to the other side for the prediction of the structure. So we can go here. So, and then we just fill in the sequence and then we just press submit and then we have to wait a little bit. Yeah, but probably it will show that the sequence is two globular structures, so two little kind of balls with a uh, site in the middle. I, I'm actually a little bit, I'm actually a little bit surprised that they kind of changed the website. They made it look much, much more fancy, but the information density and the, uh, and the, the the ability to click on it and, and, and investigate it more is actually, it, it actually is gone entirely, which is really, really a shame. Because it, it used to also show you link outs to which other species have this thing and have which other proteins have a, have a similar one. Um, so, all right, let's use the reload button here. All right, so here it predicts it, and then in the 3D structure, it doesn't predict it. So you're, you're not really coming up with really, really good proteins, which have really nice structure, uh, <laughs> fortunately. Um, that's a shame. That's really a shame. But at least the, uh, the Interpro site, it used to be, um, it, it used to have like a, a whole bunch of information which you could like click on and then investigate further, see all the other ones which have them. Um, yeah, these are then all of the families that you have. Um, they do still have the taxonomy browser. 
So there should still be a way to get there. Anyway, um, it is um, up to you during the um, during the assignments to kind of figure out how we can how we can get back to because the the idea is is that have, you can learn a lot about these proteins by looking at the uh, uh, by, by by looking at the the, the Interpro website and then just drilling down right and seeing oh this protein occurs in mice in humans and in rats uh, but it doesn't occur in fish and so we can kind of pinpoint the evolutionary origin to uh, this many uh, thousand years ago hey, because the we know kind of when several species split from each other anyway um, it's I think the interpro um, is one of the things that you guys have to click around on um, and I just wanted to show you that it's there and uh, if you have a more complex protein a more longer protein hey if you if you would fill in the ribosome it would take like a couple of 15 to 20 minutes to come up with a result um, but then it would show you the different parts of the ribosome so say well this is probably a P side uh, this is probably the E side and this is probably the A side um, is there an alternative to Interpro? E yes, there are literally hundreds of alternatives um, because you have um, the protein DB, um, so the RSCP. Um, so let me show you Firefox again. Um, but this actually is um, so. This one, um, the problem here is is that it doesn't allow you to do the predictions. Uh, you can only look up um, proteins which are known. So this is the spotted hyena. This is the pseudoterrans. Um, but if we have, so if we are uh, if we're interested in uh, before, for example, um, hemoglobin, uh, hemoprotein, so hemoglobin. So and then we can go to hemoglobin, and then head this. This just has different crystal structures. Um, if you click on the crystal structures, it will give you an overview of the the structure, and it should also show you uh, the different domains, which in this case is just the hemoglobin domain. Um, so there's two: the B chains and the D chains. This is from the Drosophila, um, but it doesn't have this. The, the the, the Interpro used to have this very nice overview of the domains and where in the domains um, the differences were. Let me look at the assignments actually because I think during the assignments there's another database which I wanted you guys to look at. Uh, so it's Interpro. No, no I didn't have this uh, Yeah, so there's the RSCP. Yeah, so this is the website that I want you guys and get the protein sequence from a uh, from the ensemble database. What is the 119? So then we can go to here. Then we would look for this protein. So it's an oxyreductase protein. Um, so we just can go here, and then. So here we see the, um, hey, here you have the protein sequence, and here you have the unmodeled. But they used to have a really nice overview, oh, a few more in-depth experimental data. Nah, that's so bad that they changed that. Um, PDB statistics, map genome position, visualize, search, basic search, advanced search. Yeah, now I know what I'm searching for. Why did they not? They used to have this really, really nice where you could just click on a on a on a position, and then it would get a domain. Uniprot. Yeah, that's probably a better one. Yeah. So Uniprot is really nice as well. And I want to look for this one. So just take the human one. So this is what it catalyzes. And here, yeah, so here, this is the thing that I actually wanted. That it, um, This used to be an Interpro as well, where you could just look at the at the overview. So at position 677, and there's a substrate binding site, and there's more binding site for substrates. There's a NADP binding site for the energy. And then you have the uh, critical for catalysis site. And this is actually like one of the assignments is, um, have, 
one of the assignments is, is what happens when we change the amino acid at position 109 and so at 109 there's a binding site for the substrate and it used to be that here they also had that but here like if I go to 109 100 that's interesting that they some atom are not reported partially mod modulated residue I can't even click here on the PDB right when I when I when I go here and I say oh I want to click on the PDB link then, then it doesn't even allow me to do that I hate that they change databases every couple of years yeah they might just have outsourced it that's true that's true that they just because they they probably focus more on the on the 3d structures because I use them a lot to uh, get structures of proteins and then here yeah, because here you have like the over because this is what what you want right um, top right uh, here top right DOI classification download files display files structure double symmetry final summaries right 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 no down. All right, go down, 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 down. Three D ligands. Anyway, I would just search it in the uh, Uniprot database because here, this is kind of what I wanted. So here, what what you see is you see the f feature key, right? So what are the different, more or less bindings? Or so have binding sites and other sites that are known, and then here you see the position in the protein. Right, so now if you would start modifying, of course, the amino acid at this position, uh, this would have a massive effect on substrate binding. And you can then look in the publication which actually which structure or which uh, um, which thing is binding here. Um, but structure validation, deposit data, up above, right side. Why don't you have the Mutations, toy literature. I don't. I don't see. Oh, um, is this one? No, that's the that's the link to this page. Three D view. Annotations. Binding. Do they have experiments? Sequence. Ah. This is what I was looking for. So they do have it, but it's now under the, the tab. It used to be just in the main overview. Um, yeah, but if you search for things in the PDB, which is like, th this is the oldest database, right? This is the one from the 1960s that I told you guys about. Um, so yeah, when, you, when you know what kind of a protein it is, and here you can actually see that at position 109, right? You see that here there's the sheet. Um, and then there's a binding site at position 109. So during the, the assignments, the idea was that if you look at this um, IDH1 gene, hey, what would happen if you would start changing the amino acid, if you would have a mutation which changed it, hey, what would happen? So in this case, the binding site probably would be lost. Hey, and then here, um, hey, the same thing would happen. Hey, so you have different binding sites for different, different proteins. And uh, it's uh, uh, NADP, which is bound here. Uh, then here we have binding of NADP as well, another um, substrate, so this is the substrate, so the substrate you can get from the um, summary structure, no not from the summary structure, but here. So this one here has the substrate, right, because it, it takes this day 3 isotrat takes NADP plus, and then it transforms this to oxoglutarate. And so you can see then that at the binding site for the, uh, for the NADP um, is Using the all right here. So if we go then to sequence, then you see here that the binding sites for the different substrates are there, right? So this is the substrate binding site, and you see that the substrate binding site is in there multiple times, right? And that is because it's a 3D structure. So actually, this amino acid position here for the substrate is very close physically to this position, and this position again is very close to uh, this this position. Right, so three dimensionally, position one hundred, uh, uh, position seventy-seven, uh, position one hundred and nine, 
and position one, uh, 212 are physically kind of forming a little pocket uh, which hold the uh, treoisocitrate. And then hey, they have, there are four positions in this protein which then hold the NADP+, plus, so that, that's position 82, combined with um, position, uh, that's substrate as well, substrate, NADP, so here, and uh, NADP. So there's three positions which hold the NADP, and then there's four positions which hold the substrate, which are physically close. And so what it does, it is actually it's catalyzing this reaction. So it it kind of physically holds this molecule, then takes this molecule and then transforms it into this molecule by um, using uh, ATP. I think there's also an ATP binding site somewhere. Um, Anyway, Ed, you can see that there's a lot of information in these databases and um, Ed, the idea was for you to kind of experiment through the databases yourself. Um, I'm not really a protein scientist, I'm more like a geneticist, but Ed, the, the, the idea is, is that, that there's so much protein information available, um, but in this case I like the, the Uniprot much more because they just have this nice little table where you can just look at it, which is the thing that I actually was looking for because this one used to have a, a table as well without having this really fancy coloring and stuff which flashes if you hover over it. All right, I think that that was more or less it. Um, there was one thing that I wanted you guys um, to be aware of. Um, there is a, a special issue on proteins in the big learning picture, so I made a link to that. And this is the thing that I like the most and that is the paper models of different proteins. Um, so let's click on it, go to Firefox. And um, so you can, you, can, you can make your own proteins. So um, I would like everyone at home to print the tRNA. So you have the, the, the assembly PDF right here, right? So you, can, you, you have the description here and then here you have the printout <laughs> in color if you want. And then um, you, can, you can fold it. So you, you just connect everything together. So you're just building your own amino acid chain and then you have to, to fold it to make a real tRNA. Great Christmas present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they have a lot. So, and this one, the tRNA is really nice, right? Because you see here the, the phi. So this is the mod modified uracil, right? And then here you see the binding site. Um, and then here you see the phenyl, uh, the, 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 the amino acid. And then hey, you really get the idea of, of how these things in, in a 3D structure work. Um, so this is this is something that I just wanted to show you guys and um, do the tRNA. The tRNA is one of the better ones. Um, I did the DNA one as well. Um, so there's the, the DNA. The antibody is fun, but it's a little bit difficult because it's like very stringy and, sh and, and stuff. Um, so I would definitely do the tRNA. That's not too big. Um, and then the um, the H no the dengue uh, I think was also really fun. So it's the dengue icosahedron, which is just very easy to do um, because it's just <laughs> printing it out and, and clipping it together, like it's not doing the whole chain. Uh, but the, uh, the the one that I really like was the was the tRNA. So I would advise everyone to to print out and and make a tRNA and put it somewhere or give it as a Christmas gift or hang it in the Christmas tree. Uh, I think that was it for today. Um, so I talked to you guys about the history of proteins. I talked about structure, so primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure. Um, yeah, so primary structure, uh, physical atom bindings, uh, secondary structure, physical atom bindings, plus hydrogen bridging. Third structure, um, you include the other, uh, the other um, um, forces as well. Purification identification, we talked about that, that or I talked about that a little bit. Um, the purification part won't come back. The identification part will come back next week very extensively about how mass spec works and all of these things. Uh, the function prediction, like hey, what are protein domains, what are protein families, phylogenetic trees, homology, and all of these terms like ortholog, paralog, senolog, imparalog, outparalog, and these things. So that's it for today. I will actually stop the recording because I'm...